One comment on house prices, that's probably the question I get the most from international investors, whether I'm offshore or here, you know, when is the housing market going to bust? There was another article in the paper during the week uh, from um, uh, an international analyst who said Sydney is a bubble about to burst. I was on a platform last week um, and the other speaker was the uh, Treasurer of Victoria. So he stood up and said, oh, by the way, I'm pleased to announce that Melbourne is the uh, most livable city in the world and Sydney has dropped out of the top 10. And then I stood up and said, well, I understand that's something that's coming from The Economist magazine, which, by the way, for the last 10 years has been predicting a 40% fall in Sydney house prices. So I'm really, really worrying about the credibility of that analysis. Look, my view on Sydney house prices is that if you look in the long, long term, um, it moves in, uh, in stages. So you're going to have periods where house prices will move quickly. Then you'll have a long period where incomes get ahead of house prices so you can stabilise and then you can move ahead again. I think we're moving into another stable period. The people that say that house prices are overvalued only look at um, price to income ratios or rent to income ratios. They don't look at affordability. So price to income ratios, rent to income ratios don't take interest rates into account. And surprise, surprise, one of the main reasons why housing remains affordable in Sydney today, uh, it's better than long-term average affordability, is the low rates. So if you thought that rates were going to go up to the mortgage rates were going to double in the next couple of years, then certainly you'd be very worried about house prices in Sydney and Melbourne. But in the current environment, in the world environment, what bond markets are telling us, that's not going to happen. So the idea that, you, that house prices are so far overvalued in a, in a world of low interest rates and uh, average affordability, I find uh, uh, unacceptable. So let me now talk finally about the last cycle. And the last cycle is the most important one for us, has been in the past and is becoming so again. And that's the housing construction cycle. So if you look at the mining investment cycle and compare, contrast that with the housing construction cycle, you can see that at the peak of mining investment, the amount of money spent was about equal to the amount of money spent on housing. You can see that for housing, that grey line, flat line for a long period of time. So the, that cycle was dormant. And recently, of course, that cycle's taken off. And the real question mark for me on how growth is going to evolve in the Australian economy over the next few years very much depends upon the shape of that cycle because clearly one of the key drivers of that cycle has been apartment investment. So at the moment, the late, latest data we have from the Bureau of Statistics is that 110,000 high-rise apartments are currently under construction. And if you compare that to the peak back in the early 2000s when we had our last big apartment boom, uh, the peak there was about 35,000. Um, over the last year, the number of high-rise apartments under construction has risen by nearly 50%. Now, 45,000 of that 110 are in New South Wales, most of that Sydney, 35,000 are in Melbourne, uh, in Victoria, most of that Melbourne, about 25,000 in Queensland. So the real question is, what's that line going to look like over the next few years? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer. There's so many complications in this. Let's think about it. What proportion of this is um, what we call FERB investors, international investors? Uh, we think that in Melbourne, in the high rise, it's about 50%, but most of the other investors also have Asian names. So most of those are Australian citizens, but where are they getting their funding from? Question mark. Second issue, uh, about four months ago, the banks in their wisdom decided not to lend money to FERB investors. So a FERB investor, who had committed in, uh, to a uh, off-the-plan purchase two years ago and is now going to the bank. I've, the developer has told me the deal is now ready for settlement. Can I have my money? And the banks are saying, no, go and find it somewhere else. So how big a dislocation is that going to be? At this stage anyway, it appears that it's not much of a dislocation, uh, particularly in Sydney. They're finding their money in other ways. Maybe I've overestimated the way in which the the Chinese authorities, for instance, have been able to constrain money leaving the country. Maybe there's foreign banks that are filling the gap. Maybe they didn't need the money in the first place, because the, the banks were pushing the money onto them, so they took it. 
So that's the first question mark that I have. The second question mark is around developers themselves. The Australian developers are now complaining that um, the, they can't compete with the international developers. International developers, many of them, these state-owned enterprises that I talked to you before about getting, who are getting the very cheap funding and are maybe not necessarily looking at their country but looking at other countries to develop. Uh, how big are they in this overall market? Now the data I'm seeing at the moment suggests they could be 50% of all developments. And in a year's time, they might be 75% of all developments. And if they're dominating it and they're getting very cheap funding, this thing could keep going. If it wasn't for the international influence, we could certainly look at population growth, look at the pace at which supplies and say, oh, it'll stop soon. Um, if it doesn't stop soon, then we're going to get more and more growth coming from this cycle. I'm not sure what the end game is going to be, but we'll certainly continue to get massive activity. So in terms of the growth story for Australia, it's what that cycle looks like that'll be the most important factor. Uh, and as I said, there are so many variables in that one that we haven't seen before that no one can be confident about exactly what that's going to look like. I said 110,000 under construction. That's as at March, that's the latest data we've got under construction. Since then, we've seen another 35,000 approved. So that's 145,000 that may well be under construction in a few months' time. These are mind-boggling numbers. It's going to either mean a huge, huge construction cycle or at some point something else might happen. So I don't know the answer to that. It's the thing that bothers me the most of anything apart from maybe the state of the European banking system. But it's certainly something that uh, makes my job as interesting as it ever was. So let me conclude. Um, let me just show you some of the simulations we're doing. So let's say that over the next year, approvals lift another 50%. So in that year, we'd be up at about 160,000 this time next year under construction. Let's say if we're wrong and suddenly the market stops, that people stop supporting it, there's too much, they can't get their funding, we could be down to 60,000. Uh, these are big, big cycles that we're talking about that will be important for growth.